Undercover Jet Setter, travel. We all saw the moving ceremonies for the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion that ended World War II in Europe. So are you interested in going? If so, we have an expert who is a world traveler and a retired Marine general who has some tips for you if you love history, food, and even golf. Hi, everyone. John Daly here. Welcome to the Undercover Jet Setter podcast. This is a compliment to our TV show that you can get on YouTube for free. It's youtube.com slash undercover jet setter. And that TV show is also shot on the iPhone. This radio broadcast is not. We are talking about Normandy, France today and why you should go. And my guest is Dick Verkaterin. He is a retired Brigadier General from the U.S. Marine Corps. He is a recipient of the Navy Distinguished Service Medal. He also served in Vietnam. He is a world traveler. We have that in common, and we both graduated from Providence College. Dick, welcome to Undercover Jet Setter. Thanks, John. Good to be here. Great to be here with you. And as we usually do, cheers. And in honor of our conversation, I'm having a sip of Calvados, which is the aperitif and brandy of Normandy made from apples. It is a great after-dinner brandy. I know you've tried it, Dick. And then tell me, what are you sipping on? I'm uh, sipping on a little uh, Calvados myself. Not sure that it's the same volume and strength as yours, but uh, it's good. Well, and you said you've actually had Calvados in Normandy, and you said there's actually a wide range of, you know, kind of low end to high end as well. And they're uh, still pretty good though, right? Oh yeah, they're uh, definitely uh, definitely good to uh, drink. Uh, it's like drinking apple ju- uh, apple juice with wow. a little strength in it. <laughs> All right, we're going to give folks tips on planning a trip to Normandy. But first, Dick, give me give me the top three reasons they should go to Normandy. Well, uh, John, uh, there's so much there, and um, and uh, let me let me just go through and describe uh, first the area. Then the people in Normandy, the food of Normandy, and uh, as John said, there's also uh, 29 golf courses there. So if you want to go and combine a historical tour with uh, with a little fun off the side, uh, there there good there's good golf there. Wow! Uh, without a doubt, Normandy has some of the uh, most gorgeous scener- uh, scenery possible. The rolling terrain with broad vistas, apple orchards, dairy cows, quiet pastures, and golden hay fields are postcards forever in my mind, in uh, your mind's eye. The uh, the roads leading into the villages with stone buildings and narrow streets are enchanting. Um, the um, the fact that it's been 75 years since the U.S. landed in Normandy um, is is uh, amazing. The human sacrifice, the planning, the technology to win the war against Nazi Germany is today hard to imagine. Visiting Normandy from Pegasus Bridge near Sword Beach in the east to Omaha Beach and Utah Beach in the west can help put D-Day June 6, 1944, in perspective. The area of D-Day landing beaches are populous tourist sites to all visitors from around the world. But there's so much to see from museums to um, areas that uh, that uh, talk about the history of the battle and every, every museum that known the man if if you like museums, this is the place to go. There are some 40-plus museums of all ranges and all sizes. There are monuments. The beaches and the vistas are, are just spectacular. Wow. that's And there is a lot of good stuff there. Now, you, you told me before that before you plan, you need to kind of take in your personal goals. Go Go through some of them if you can quickly, because the first thing you said is, you need to know if you're going to be able to walk. Oh yeah, there's there's um you can drive anywhere. Um I mean the roads are very nice. The people are wonderful. The restaurants along the roads are good, but if you um if you want to walk through the battlefield sites, be they uh English, Canadian, US, you have to be able to, to hoof it quite a bit. Okay. And and how about being being kind of a history nut? I'm a history nut, but um, a lot of how you're going to plan, I would imagine, if you are a history nut. Explain explain that and how, how it might determine how you do plan. Well, um, 
the way I did it, the, the way uh, my wife and I did it was we rented a car in uh, Cannes, France. Cannes is um, about two hours and 42 minutes by car from Paris. We we took a train to Paris, which is about three hours, and rented a, ca a car in Cannes. Because once you get to Cannes, you can uh, cover all of the area um, around the beaches up to uh, Omaha Beach and uh, Utah Beach, Aramash, and uh, many of the areas there. But um, yeah, along the way, there are great restaurants, great hotels. We, um, we stayed in Luc Sumer, which is right on the beach for a couple of weeks. Uh, well, one week we stayed there, and then we moved on. Um, if you if you have time, we did about two weeks there. If you have time, uh, you can do a majority of the area from uh, both the uh, English side, the American side, the German side, the Canadian side, and et cetera, et cetera. But... Um, it's um, it's quite quite a broad vista. Although the beaches are pretty close, uh, they're you know you can drive 50 miles and uh, cover a lot of the area. But if you go off the road um, it, to get to some of the uh, in inward from the beach sites, um, you you need a car. Okay. The amazing thing about Normandy are the people. They're friendly. They're kind-hearted. They're compassionate. Really solid, down to earth people, and yes, many speak English, especially the younger ones who study it in school and want to practice. Um, our ultimate destination for planning purposes was um, Utah Beach, where my uncle landed, mm -hmm. World War II. Um, it was the largest armada ever assembled. There, we we had some uh, twelve to. 1,213 warships, 4,126 transport vessels, other 736 ancillary craft, 864 merchant vessels, and 195,000 personnel. And um, they had to overcome quite a bit. When you look at the terrain from the German side, it's absolutely amazing the heroism that all Allied forces portrayed in getting onto the beaches. Um, being a tactician and a strategist uh, professionally, and a his you know historical in looking at it from a historical perspective, the the landing was miraculous. Uh, the fact that you dropped two airborne divisions behind the lines on 5 June, and they somehow survived to cut off German lines, and and let's not forget the French resistance who did a hell of a job cutting command and control lines that prevented the Germans from knowing where the true landing was, uh, where, where the true landings were. One thing to remember is there was a heck of a deception plan in play all throughout Europe as to where the real landing was going to be. There had mm -hmm. to be a deception plan, which was Operation Fortitude, that showed that possibly we could land in Norway or land down south in Spain, and throughout there was uh, fortitude north and fortitude south. When you combine that with the French resistance, even though we had ships in the English channels, which, which the Germans could see, and the fact they had spies in England watching what was going on, the fact that um, all this was put together starting in 1943 as a historical marvel, to say nothing of the the execution of the the effort when when uh, the landing occurred. The landing was supposed to land on 5 June, but the weather was so terrible that they couldn't get the airborne up in the air. Plus, they only had a window of about three days till about the ninth or tenth to do the landing because of the tides and because of the horrible weather. One, of the, some of the worst, some of the worst um, weather that Europe had seen during that time of the year. So, the major units uh, that participate in the invasion is is overwhelming when you think about it in the space of time. 
That's why we started at Pegasus Bridge, because that's where the gliders landed first, to take out the uh, German units at the bridge and at Merville. Ah, so interesting. So, um, so when when some would you, would you say that is one of three things that that people have to see? In other words, if you're someone going there, would you consider that one of the things to go see to to really understand what happened in 1944? You mean um, you mean um, uh, Pegasus Bridge? Yes, that area. Y- yes, yes. That that's. Um... As you looked at the beach from north to south, looking at it from England, that was the left flank of the operation. Uh, the left flank of Pegasus Bridge, where the gliders landed, conducted, uh, uh, there, there was a whole uh, army uh, corps uh, and uh, airborne uh, units that landed the gliders there near Sword Beach. Then the Canadians came in at Juno Beach, Canadian, mostly Canadian. The Brits came in at Sword Beach. Uh, another Brit unit came in the Gold Beach, and then the Fifth Corps, compro- comprised of the First Army Division, landed at Omaha. Then the Seventh Corps landed at Utah Beach. So, from the perspective of looking at it from England to France and crossing the Channel which wasn't that far, but it was an an enormous effort in planning and execution. In fact, the largest amphibious assault ever recorded. Right. There's some some wonderful museums that depict all of this, and there are so many museums you have to pick and choose. One of my favorites is the Airborne Museum in St. Mary Glees, where the Airborne um, jumped in, both the 101st and the 82nd. The Airborne Museum actually uh, portrays in a cutout C-47, a, uh, an aircraft at the time that uh, was used to to uh, jump the Airborne in. Uh, you can actually stand in the window of the plane, look wow. down, and it's all it, 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 it's all it, it's got the sounds as if you're actually in a plane jumping. And it's it's amazing. In addition to uh, Eisenhower talking to the airborne troops, a picture, a model of Eisenhower talking to them, which is a fer- very famous uh, picture prior to the operation. So from the standpoint of <clears throat> planning, first you have to determine what you want to do. Then look at how much time you had. We had two weeks, and then we went back a second time. So we spent probably a total of four weeks in the area over a two-year period. And that allows you to really get into the both sides of the uh, of the battlefield because there's so much there. Even though it's, they're short distances, um, it, it's amazing um, at uh, the amount of sacrifice that occurred there. I mean, Germans alone had 240,000 killed or missing. Britain mm-hmm. had 11,000. Canada had 5,000 killed, not counting 13,000 wounded. We lost 29,000 killed and 106,000 mm-hmm. wounded. France lost 12,000 civilians killed or missing. And though it, it's commonly agreed that these are not ex- exact statistics, they're because they're not possible because of the number of people that were lost. And then you had other countries, Belgium, Greece, Netherlands, Australia, N- New Zealand, Norway, Denmark, that all participated. And, and there are individual monuments to all those units, including the one to 800 Danish troops for their heroic achievement throughout Normandy. Um, but as far as I have looked at and studied, there's no overall casualty list. But when you get to the cemetery at Colville Sumer, you realize just the enormity and the cost and human suffering that occurred to uh, to uh, get that force ashore and invade Europe and end up in Berlin eventually. Wow. 
Well, we are talking uh, about heading to Normandy, France with Dick Verkaterin. He is a retired Brigadier General from the U.S. Marine Corps. He's also a world traveler, uh, and he certainly knows a lot about the history of World War II. Um, Dick, one of the books, and I know you had mentioned this to me, and I actually went back to read this again, is um, the book by Stephen Ambrose uh, called D-Day. And what amazed me in going back and reading it and ties into what you're saying there is that the majority of the Americans who were uh, actually storming the shores there were like 18 to 24 years old. These were these were the newbies getting into the war. These were the ones who didn't start the war. But um, you know, Eisenhower was commanding a lot of really young, you know, new soldiers. And at the same time, too, it was believed that they were going up against the greatest army, uh, Hitler's, you know, Nazi army. Uh, yet at the same time, too, Hitler had really spread himself thin. So they were bringing in anti-communists from all over the place to fight, and they weren't as ready. So there was there was a little bit of luck involved there, too, in addition to the fact we had these young fighters who turned out to be pretty good fighters. And at the same time, too, a lot of them aren't around today because they they got to be in their 90s. Well, yeah, when you look at the uh, the anniversary a couple of weeks ago that was on TV, and you look at the age of those guys uh, that are sitting there, 90, 95, 96, the guy that jumped was 98, I believe, uh, re replicated his jump on D-Day. Um, and the fact that uh, this was 1944, some of these, uh, some of these folks uh, were – were new recruits because we had been fighting the war for since 1941 in both the Pacific and and the uh, Atlantic and North Africa, and so planning for D-Day had actually begun in 1943. And as I talked about Operation Fortitude, uh, the deception plan to include uh, fabricating tanks and a whole army of uh, fake uh, uh, weaponry led by uh, Patton, who actually despised being the the uh, commanding general of an army that did not exist, but that was all part of the deception plan. Mm -hmm. And when you combine that with the English Channel's erratic weather, that caused a great deal of concern, as did the asymmetric tides. I think one of the things that people see when they go to Normandy is that the English Channel is one of the only places in the world where there are four tides, one every six hours. Uh -huh. And you can actually sit in your hotel room and watch the tides go out where you can actually walk almost 800 to 1,000 meters into the water, and it's mud flats, and people are out there getting um, mouliers, as they call them. Mm -hmm. um, and then six hours later, you got a flood tide coming in that's uh, 20. 24, you know, 24 feet and up to the, up to the, uh, right up to the water, not 24 feet, 24, uh, yeah, 24 feet. Um, when it's low tide on the French coast, it's high tide on the English coast. There are 10 days a month when the tides are suitable for an amphibious landing. So this was originally planned, as I said earlier, as June 5th. Mm -hmm. But Eisenhower changed the landing uh, the following day because of projected weather conditions. And then after June 6th, on June 9th, the worst storm in 40 years hit the English Channel. So it's important to, uh, to understand uh, all the factors that went into to, uh, the planning for this operation. Uh, and, and and if if you like if you like history if you like geography if you like uh, just hanging with good people if you like the food the mouillets are wonderful um, and it, it it's just a great place to go. Well, let me let me ask you this because um, you talked about the things that they should do. Um, are there like can you just I mean, can you just stop into any restaurant? Is it is it just like, you know, take a pick and they're all going to be fairly good? I mean, they've had great Ab success. Absolutely. And absolutely. Whether you want crepes in the morning or uh, beignets in the morning or uh, chocolate croissants in the morning. I and When we're in Luc Sumer, I would just simply get down to the bakery around the corner. They got the they got to know me as a homeboy because I speak a decent <laughs> amount of French. 
Uh-huh. And I'd sat in there and have a coffee and pick up my beignets, take them back to the hotel room, and uh, we would just enjoy on the uh, on the uh, overlook uh, overlooking the beach. Uh, but yeah, you can go in. No no reservations needed. Uh, if the weather's nice, you can eat outside. Uh, the the people, uh, whether you speak French or not, uh, are very nice and very friendly. Uh, they you know the thing is they've never forgotten. They've never forgotten who came in on June 6th to uh, really uh, save the French from uh, Vichy, Vichy Nazi, Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing how they remember that and they uh, glorify it, even the young ones. One of the things to remember um, is behind the beaches – one thing I, I've got to say is behind the beaches are natural hedgerows, hedgerows, hedgerows that that uh, had to be navigated once you crossed the beach. So landing at the beach was one thing. Fighting against um, the Germans and the, uh, the the mines that were set in on the beach and the tetrahedrons and the machine gunnery and the artillery was one thing. But once you got into those hedgerows and back, you were kind of restricted into your movement uh-huh. so if you had a machine gun nest in those hedgerows you had to fight your way through that which was which was very difficult um you know the the bunkers that line the terrain above the beaches part of uh, hitler's atlantic wall are particularly interesting to look at because when you look at this from the german side when you look at the the artillery positions whether it be Merville or any others at Oosterham or, or uh, further west, they all covered the beach landings. Even though the deception plan um, worked in, in, uh, in not ensuring when the landing was going to be uh, to the Germans, the fact was that they had a lot of troops on, on the beaches on the Atlantic Wall. One side like to this that a lot of people probably don't know or have read anywhere was Hitler slept till noon that day. So wow. he didn't really know that we had landed at, you know, starting it uh, in the morning with the airborne. Um, Rommel, who commanded the 21st Panzers uh, down in the vicinity, headquarters down in the vicinity of Juno and Sword, uh, was... Um, uh, was on leave, so you had basically the 21st Panzers, which was under the operational control of um, of Hitler, not able to react on the attacks along Gold, Juno, and Sword Beach. So all those little factors that have come out in his history books along the along the way had a great impact on us being able to execute the landing and execute the fight thereafter because after we after we moved in and took the fillets gap and uh, some of the peninsula uh, my uncle in particular moved west and started uh, the attack and he fought at Bastogne uh, in December of that same year which was uh, as as the as the war was concluding so it, it's interesting to see how wow. this all plays out. Wow. Uh, inter- Stephen Ambrose talks about how Rommel uh, felt that uh, Hitler wasn't using him as a general uh, correctly and that Hitler was actually acting as a general. And yeah. um, and, and Rommel seemed a, a little bit, uh, you know, he, he was a soldier, but he wasn't necessarily uh, anti-American or he didn't necessarily hate the Americans. That's right. Um, he was They're he was clear. just fighting there that way, and then at the same time too, he felt Hitler was uh, sticking his hand too much into uh, the pot that the general yeah, should be was, doing. He was a micromanager, no question there. Um, let me ask you this: when you're talking about these different things, like those those hedge groves and 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 the and the different areas that are being preserved, are there hotels nearby that so that it's 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 within uh, pretty good uh, you know pretty easy distance to get to if you're if you're staying there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we went from Con to ba- Bayou, and of course, don't miss the um, don't miss the uh, the great 
uh, tapestry in the Bayou uh, Museum there, if you go there. And we stayed at the Churchill Hotel. How appropriate. Um, in the Churchill Hotel in Bayou. And then we started driving down. But in answer to your question directly, yeah, there are plenty of hotels uh, along the beach. There are plenty of B&Bs. No shortage of uh, welcomes. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, we we stayed in Luc Sumer because that was convenient between Khan, and it was along the beach, and we wanted to stay along the beach. And uh, we've stayed there a couple times, actually, uh, and then drove up to the other beaches uh, uh, quite readily on day visits. One thing, one thing I want to mention is that at Gold Beach, there's a town called Aramash, which is a wide sweep of beach that protrudes uh, into anchoring into a uh, anchor at the far end. After the British established the beachhead, they headed towards. Uh, Bayou along Route 13 and cut off the road to Khan. Very crucially, the British installed the bridge that had taken a year to design and build in England called the Mulberry Bridge. And you can see those in the harbor. Um, parts of the bridge were called Mulberries or in the water. The Allies had to get supplies ashore as quickly as uh -huh. possible in order to continue the attack. And historic, historians say that these mulberry bridges more likely more like heavy pontoons and the cutting of German communications line by the Free French resistance prior to invasion were essential to the Operation Overlord. Um, the French resistance uh, is just now getting enough credit for their participation in the war, but they did an amazing job, be they men, women, kids. Mm -hmm. Because the Germans had started to establish the German Wall once they took over Paris, yep, and um, it was uh, interesting to, uh, to to see how important these these uh, mulberries became and the French resistance became. Well, and I think one of the things too is when you think of uh, American technology that um, started turning out all these different technologies from like 42 on, even the landing boats, those landing boats had to be engineered in a totally different way uh, because of the terrain. They had to make sure the propellers were not on the bottom, but in the back. They had to make sure that they could, you know, drop it down so that the, so the troops getting out aren't going to drown their, their machine guns or their rifles as they're going up there. So when you think about what we turned out, technology-wise, and how it actually propelled our post-war economy into what was the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and you just realize the impact that when you're there, you're going to look at that, and, and, and that should sink in. Yeah, absolutely. You're speaking of the Higgins boat, which were developed by Higgins in New Orleans. Yep. If you go to the World War II Museum in New Orleans, before you go to Normandy, that would that would give you an insight as to what happened technologically and all the things that you mentioned that occurred. Um, actually, the LCM-6 with the Higgins boat and the LCM-8, the bigger boat, I've actually landed in around the world and at various times. So those things have stood the test of time uh, with a flat bottom and the ability to land on a beach that uh, had a, uh, a low gradient to put troops ashore. Um, yeah, they're uh, they 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 are amazing, and uh, they're they're still in use. The, wow. the LCM eight and the so to speak, and the technology is still in use. And again, take a look at the um, the book uh, by Stephen Ambrose, the history uh, of D Day. Um, that was it, it came out like in the early 1990s. It's still a relevant book today, and they talk a lot about that as well. We are talking about heading to Normandy, France with Dick Verkotteren. He is a retired Brigadier General from the U.S. Marine Corps. He's also a world traveler. Dick, let's let's talk about golf here a little bit, which is kind of strange. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about history and all that. Uh, you and I have obviously played a lot of golf tournaments together. Um, France is getting more and more into golf. They had the Ryder Cup there, but you say there's a lot of good golf courses up in the Normandy area. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 29 golf courses that can be you can drive to on any given day uh, that spread across. There's one in particular that I've played up at. Uh, it's called Omaha Beach Golf Club. It sits wow. right above Omaha Beach, 27 holes. 
Um, it's a very popular. There's a hotel you can stay at. It's in the town just up the, the street from the little town of Port Bassin, P-O-R-T-B-E-S-S-I-N. There's a hotel there that's accommodating and a very good, uh, very good place to go. That's the only one I've particularly played, uh, but there are another 20 plus golf courses uh, in in the uh, Normandy area. So I would think if you wanted to play golf there, it'd be fairly easy to get on. It's not like you know you've got you know you get, you go to certain Caribbean islands and they you know the whole island they're bringing in millions of people. They got two golf courses, uh, but this it looks like. Um, if you wanted to play golf, it would be fairly easy to get on. And was it was it expensive? No, no, not at all. I forget the price, but twenty, probably less than fifty bucks. Wow. It's not okay. Like, it's not like you're playing Pebble Beach for five hundred bucks or anything like that. All right. Talk if you can talk about that course a little bit because uh, you know a lot of us are going to have in in our minds is it, is it kind of like a is it like a links course, like you might be playing in um, Ireland, Scotland, or the UK, uh, or no, does actually, it play more yeah, like an American course? It plays more like an American course, not a links course. Mm-hmm. Okay. All and right, cool. uh, yeah, I've played some of the Scottish courses. I'm going to England here in a, in another month or two to play those those courses down near Southport. Uh, and some friends of mine just got back from Ireland, um, and those were all links courses. Okay. All right, cool. Um, I want to I want to get back a little bit because you you you're taking us through kind of a fascinating uh, uh, journey, um, and at the same time, too, you and I um, we both knew the late great Yogi Berra, and most people don't realize he was part of D-Day, and you actually heard him talk about that at one point. Yeah, it's amazing how these things uh, serendipitously come to line. Um, I was invited when I was uh, in the corporate world. I was invited to the Navy Memorial Dinner in Washington, D.C. to honor uh, former Navy or Marine veterans. That night, um, the uh, the honorees were the CEO of FedEx, uh, Smith, Estee Lauder, who uh, is not her, but uh, the son, Estee Lauder, who was a Navy lieutenant. Um, wow. Fred, Fred Smith was a Marine captain, my vintage in Vietnam, so um, uh, he uh, he he was honored, and then Yogi Berra was there, and I had the opportunity to sit with Yogi and talk about um, about his time. And um, funny thing about Yogi is he's a very funny. He was a very funny guy in in real life, but that night he gave a speech that was very sobering because he was on the third wave as a coxswain on an LCM-6 boat that landed at, uh, at uh, I believe it was Omaha Beach. Yes, it was Omaha Beach. And um, it's hard to believe how, how honest he was in talking about the heroism that night. And a small story, he said afterwards, after he got back, he was in his sailor suit, and he walked into Yankee Stadium, and the clubhouse manager, who had been there about 50 years, I uh, said to him, what are you doing here? He, and uh, Yogi said, um, well, I'm going to be the next Yankee catcher. And the <laughs> old crusty 50-year-old said, not only are you not going to be the next Yankee catcher, he said, you don't look much like a sailor either. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, uh, he was very funny that night. And sadly, uh, not too long after that, he uh, he died. Yeah. But oh, was, Yogi had a, Yogi had a great life. He was he was certainly a lot of fun, and he he did love to talk. I wish I had known about that when I I had a chance when I was I talked to him for maybe a couple of hours at at a, at a celebrity golf event, and he was just yeah. the kindest, sweetest man. And you'd you'd never know. The, the, and those are the unsung heroes of World War II. Those are the one. I mean, these are these are just regular guys who you know wanted to make the world better because they had grown up in the depression. And, you know, they wanted to, you know, stop fascism and, and make the world a better yeah. place. And they certainly had. So, yeah, um, even today, 62 percent of the Marine Corps and I would say the Army and Navy and Air Force the rest are the same. But 62 percent of the Marine Corps between the ages of uh, 17 and 25. So the people oh. fighting for our freedom are youngsters, really, who just got out of high school or just <laughs> just played high school football a year or two ago. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's, it's hard today, to believe. And it, it was the same back then also. Okay. Is there, you know, I, I, I'm going to wrap this up in a little bit, but is there, are, are there lessons? So when Americans go over there, are, are there, you know, we're, we're 75 years removed from that, yet at the same time, too, you know, history does bridge us. Are, are there things that people will go and will see, and then all of a sudden they'll say, oh, wow, I didn't realize. Is, is there a lesson for Americans and why they should go over there? Well, war is not cheap. And I think once you go to the cemetery with 9,000 markers mm. uh, and an endless uh, number of graves there, many of whom are unknown to this day, the endless uh, crosses and 169 stars of David seem um, almost uh, very sobering when you see the cost that uh, that occurred for taking those beaches and uh, and uh, landing um, in Omaha, Utah, or Point Du Hoc, or Gold, or Juno, or whatever. And and that's that that's the lesson you learn. It's um, it's a lesson that's hard hard earned. It's a lesson that's uh, we 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 should not look at war uh, flippantly. It's a very serious business, and uh, I think um, the fact that uh, the cross is at Colville, it's a sobering place to go to for anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't I don't care where you're from or what you do. Once you see that cemetery, you uh, you understand the cost of uh, you understand the cost of uh, the, the war. Mm-hmm. All right. Dick, this has been a fascinating journey just just talking to you. Uh, now, we would love to travel there with you. And, you know, at Undercover Jet Setter, we're, we're going to try to set up some some really cool trips. Uh, we're hoping to put something together with you um, that possibly you could you could be a little bit of a, of a guide for us. Would you be up for something like that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you'd have to you'd have to drink Calvados with me and play a round of golf with me. So I just just going to warn you about that. Well, that's uh, that's part of the burden of uh, doing this uh, sort of thing. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. <laughs> well, you're, yeah, then I, you're... I, I, I'd be, I think the best. It, it's it's there. There are good times to go and bad times to go, and I think uh, uh, winter is not the time to go. Uh, it's going to be a lot of rain. Spring. It's going to be a lot of, of cold. Rain. Yeah, yeah, a lot of cold weather. Although they're having a heat wave in Europe right now. Yeah. But uh, fall but real, is a beautiful time to go, and uh, my guess would be yeah. late late spring all the way to early fall would probably be the best bet. Yeah, yeah, um, that that would be a beautiful time, and, and you got to look at uh, hotel accommodations, and you know how many people are going to be involved in uh, transportation and uh, that sort of thing. Okay, it takes some planning, and I I would say if you're going to do this, get get a travel expert. You know, somebody, a travel agent, again, we have virtuoso travel agents that we work with here. So we can definitely yeah. put people together with that because you really need to plan that. You also need to have travel insurance. You just don't know what's going to happen there uh, at the same time, too, because cross-country travel or cross-ocean travel can be uh, can be tricky, especially in the summertime. So so yeah. good, good yeah. advice. All right. Hey, Dick, thank you so much. Uh, it, this has been great, and uh, we'll be talking more, and I'll try to get some more information to folks as well, some of the stuff that you talked about here. So we've, okay. been, uh, talk, we've been talking about heading to Normandy with Dick Verkaterin. He is a retired Brigadier General from the U.S. Marine Corps. He's also a world traveler. And don't forget, he's a Providence College grad just like me. Dick, again, thank you so much. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks, John. All right, and folks, thanks for joining us. Give us your comments on the social media page where you found this podcast. We'd love to hear from you also, and also check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is youtube.com slash undercover jet setter. Since we're talking golf, I'm going to tell you, keep swinging easy, folks. See segments and episodes at youtube.com slash undercover jet setter.